So <clears throat> that's just how it all works. And, uh, and we do collaborate with universities at times, and uh, there's a lot of interdisciplinary um, exchanging of ideas and methods as well. So all in all, cultural resource management is a good thing because it has, it actually has brought us through areas that we wouldn't normally test even, um, especially these pipeline jobs that we do for new pipelines going in. So it might not be something, someplace you would imagine a site to be, but we find sites there. So it's giving us a very good sample and adding to a very large database of where sites are. Now when I'm talking about sites for the most part, I'm talking about um, Native American sites, which is what I um, specialize in um, anywhere from 12,000 years ago up to uh, early um, colonial times, you know, post-European contact. But um, we certainly do all kinds of ar archaeology, all kinds of sites. Um, CRM actually employs more archaeologists, only about 25% of archaeologists in this country are in academics and the rest are, are pretty much working for either federal agencies or doing some sort of cultural resource management. So it is actually keeping most of us employed. And, uh, and as I said, we have, uh, we're building a database that is just great. Um, every site that is found is recorded with the state, which is why it's also very important if anybody ever finds anything. Um, to contact the state and fill out a site form. Just so if then a development's going to go in, it will trigger an archaeological survey. So they'll know, um, uh, you know, we'll find out more information. It's usually, um, if you find something, no one's going to, it's yours to keep, it's, it's, it's in your possession, but um, it's always nice to know that there's a site and it just puts a dot on the map. So if any other development comes in, <coughs> they'll know to look. Okay, so now I want to tell you a little bit about what, um, <coughs> um, how, we, how we know about the J.T. Berry site and how it was found. And so Ripley Bullen was the first to uh, record the site. However, it had been, um, it had been, people had been collecting there for years. And he found, um, he actually got a lot of information from the caretakers at uh, J.T. Berry who were at the, um, hospital, there was somebody, um, there was one man named uh, Mr. Leary who was a caretaker, and there were um, other farmers in the area uh, that had large collections that Bullen actually talked to. Um, there, he describes the sites within the project area. Um, he has, he, he actually described three sites within the project area, but there's one, um, there's a, well, I'll tell you what that says there. But uh, it's one, one thing I found, when before we started, I went and did research at the RS Peabody Museum, where a lot of the collection from the J.T. Berry site is. Bullen's, most of Bullen's collection, he was working with the RS Peabody Museum in Andover. So his collection is there. So I went and looked at it, and I found a, an old note um, in with his collection, written by an unknown author, and dated uh, October 8, 1914. And I'll just read this for you here, but it says, uh, North Reading State tuberculos Tuberculosis Hospital Grounds. This large site is a flat-topped ridge laying between Martin's Pond and the Ipswich River, partly cultivated and partly pine woods. Soil is very sandy, almost a fine dust in parts. It seems to have been a large workshop site as a large quantity of, lint of flint chips, uh, of flint chips um, were to be found all along the right or north side of a private way leading from, town, from the town road to hospital buildings. This town road cut through the site as I found several arrows and chips in the gravel bank at the side of the road. I have never seen a place where so many chips could be found at a given time, as in one hour I collected nearly three quarts and found a number of rough knives and arrows. Mr. William Mar Margertson, the superintendent of the farm, has found a number of relics in a small collection at his house. As well, these are the kind of notes we love to find in yeah. <laughs> second with collections. But um, this description, I believe, um, is definitely describes one area that Bullen had also identified as a site. So this was a note was in with um, uh, in with some artifacts, but it wasn't this particular collection. We don't know what happened to this collection, and maybe probably stayed with whoever this person is, stayed in their possession. Um, 
<clears throat> but why were, um, I just to, this is our location of the site, of course, but you can see where Martin's Pond is, and <coughs> Martin's Pond, and then the brook, and all of this uh, connected to the Ipswich River drainage and the Shawshin River drainage, and eventually actually out to the uh, Mystic River and into the bay. Could you point Boston out River. the brook, please? Excuse me? Could you point out the yes. brook? Yes. Okay. So here's Martin Pond, and then the brook comes down like this, and it comes right along the site. Where's 28? Here's, here's the brook. 28 and 28 would be over here. And here is 62? Right there? Yeah. The whole road right there. So that's 60. And so this is the site, and this is the road that runs through the site that they were just talking that I was just talking about. Um, I think the road that runs through the state hospital is this one, and it looks like this is still the same road going into the new development today. But there's also a, nice, a big road coming in. Is that a railroad bit going down through there? Yes. Yeah, there is one. Excuse me. <laughs> this is a, an electric easement or power line. Then. Oh, okay. Yeah. But there was a. But this is just showing that. So that was the whole project area that we looked at. Okay. And then all the red dots are the different sites that, or different low side that we found within the JT Berry site that we concentrated on. And we found eight of, uh, we found nine real concentration and uh, concentrated art areas of artifacts, and we will. I'll talk about those. But Bullen, Bullen um, recorded several sites, uh, many sites within the, um, the Shawshin and the Ipswich River drainage. So here's Martin's Brook, and this is the area that where J.T. Berry is. And these are some of the sites. There are three sites there that he recorded within there. Um, there are other sites. This site over here, the Heathbrook site, which is in uh, Tewksbury, is actually another project that um, I did we worked on back in um, the 90s, early 90s, I believe, and uh, did a did data recovery there. I don't believe that was ever built, um, whatever was going there. But there was a very early site, 8,000-year-old site there that we excavated. And many of these sites actually span back to about 8,000 years ago. Um, and uh, wow. several of them are large. Foster's Pond, the large site. Um, the the gravel pit behind, uh, right across the street from J.T. Berry. There was a very large site there. I believe that was um, called the Van Steensburg site, where um, there's a large collection of artifacts. So here we are again. Here's Lowell Road, or the 62, and this is the road that ran through. And these are the sites, um, one of site 103, site 44, and 112. Those are the three sites that Bullen reported within the JT Berry property. And uh, this area over here would have been the gravel pit. And there was another site down here that uh, was in a gravel pit. Um, so you can, so it really is an ideal place to have uh, been in terms of being close to water resources, uh, the water, being able to get around. We know that people, um, starting back at least 8,000 years ago, we have uh, developed forest, oak forest. People were making canoes. We have, we find tools for woodworking, and we did find some of those at JT Berry, which I'll talk about. <coughs> Here are some of the artifacts that Bullen uh, recorded. These are from the R.S. Peabody Museum. And he found this. These are the oldest, the, the Neville, Neville type of points. Now, when, I, we, I, when we find uh, spear points um, or arrowheads, there are arrowheads actually not until about 1,000 years ago, but prior to that, um, we call them spear points or projectile points. And the style tells us how old they are. And we have found them enough times in relation to charcoal that we've been able to date the charcoal so that we know how old the actual style of point mm -hmm. is. So we can look at a point and know that, uh, and just kind of like we look at cars or anything else and see the style and know exactly what the, the time period is. So that's how we date 
projectile points or stone tools because we can't um, certainly radiocarbon date them. So this is, these are the oldest. They're about uh, 8,000 years old to 6,000 6, years old. And, uh, and then the Brewerton points are about 5,000 to 4,000. This is a Manginin blade, which is uh, from a, um, that is named after a site. Many points have their names are from places where they were originally found. The Neville, the Neville points were first found on Mr. Neville's farm in Merrimack, up in uh, New Hampshire. And so the Mansion in Glade is from a site in, um, it, it's a site, it's, it's a site in Wayland, um, where there's a, a place called Mansion Inn. And then Orient Fishtail points are a little bit later. They're about between around 3,000 or 2,500 years old, and they were first named for being found out on Orient Point on Long Island. Mm -hmm. So, and they kind of look like fishtails. So that, that's part of Bullen's collection from the R.S. Peabody Museum. And again, this is just showing the different drainage basins of Massachusetts, and here we are in the Ipswich and the Shawshin. You get down through the Mystic, and eventually out to the ocean. So we, um, another shot of one of our site areas um, there. And before I go on to talk about really what we, what we found um, in particular, I just wanted to, to um, go over a couple of references that, and uh, terms that I, will, that I will use a lot. And already you've heard me talk about the time periods like 8,000 to 6,000. So we, the way that uh, we, we look at time is based on our radiocarbon dating and we, and those dates come back before present, before present time. We don't so much in this country um, use uh, BC so much, um, which you do because our, mostly based on our radiocarbon dates. Um, but AD, of course, um, is about 2,000 years ago, um, BC, uh, before 2000, but BP, we say, so 8,000 years ago, but I'm actually, it's kind of a little technicality, but it's really pre-1950, because that's when radiocarbon dating was invented, and also there was a big change um, from in the atmosphere at that time, but it's calibrated. And... But, so we say before present. And prehistory versus history, uh, prehistoric sites are pre-1492, pre-European context. <coughs> and it's also pre-written history. Native Americans did not have a written language. So we look at that um, as pre-European pre context, pre-written <coughs> history is prehistory. And um, also, we tend to use the term now, and it's almost very widely used is pre-contact, so pre-European contact or post-European contact, because Native Americans does it is their history, and so when you say prehistory, it's almost saying that there was no history prior to Europeans getting here. So we like to use the term pre-contact and post-contact versus prehistoric and historic. So these are terms that you'll hear me use. This evening. By the way, if there's any questions as I go along, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, this is a, I wish we could get rid of this, but this just says time period here. <laughs> and just to give you an overview, um, although we have the whole spectrum here in New England, and actually Bullen, many Bullen sites uh, cover the full spectrum as well, between the Paleo-Indian period is the earliest that we have. Uh, the, that this is when um, the, we first find artifacts associated with people when people first came into New England. You know, just the, um, the overview, people came over the Bering Straits from Siberia, um, most likely along the coast, um, eventually following the retreat of the glaciers and eventually up into, uh, they got to New England. And so we find our earliest sites were along the coast, and a lot of those sites we no longer can find because they are underwater. Because as the glaciers melted, the water levels rose, and a lot of those sites became inundated. 